All right, so we're going to get started for today. Um, uh, we're going to be uh, starting a new module now, looking at um, uh, a little bit more Python coding. Going to teach you how to do uh, iteration in Python. And the goal here that we're building up to is we want to teach you how to um, simulate random experiments um, in code. And that's going to be a super useful and powerful tool to be able to simulate stuff because we're going to then use these simulations for data analysis. We're going to look at um, uh, scenarios that could happen or could have happened, uh, predictions that our theories about the world might make. We're going to code up simulations to simulate what would happen if those theories were true. And then we're going to use that to start testing those theories. So that's just giving me a little bit of preview, but today we're going to get down into the details of the coding um, for how to code simulations and specifically we're going to need to do how to iterate, how to do the same thing many, many times, something that computers are very good with. Um, I apologize for not having the uh, slides and the demos set up on the course website. I'm scrambling a little bit today. Today's lecture might be a little bit more disjointed than usual. I'm going to try to follow you in chat, but because I'm kind of distracted, if I miss your question, I apologize. It's on me. I'm not as organized as I usually am today. All right. Um, announcements. Let's see. Um, uh, homework uh, four is due tomorrow, so don't forget. Um, hopefully, you've started working on the project. Um, the checkpoint is due today, and um, the next checkpoint, uh, the, sorry, the final uh, final date for project one is due next week. I have no update for you on grades. Um, we're trying to figure out what's going on. Um, we had this great moment on Wednesday night or Thursday when it's like, ooh, the auto grader is fixed and everything is working. And then we had this horrible moment where, oh no, it's broken again. And so um, I don't know what the story is. Uh, check the, the website for the deadline. Uh, I believe it's 11.59 PM tonight, but I can't check it right now. <laughs> Maybe you should all get A's. <laughs> oh man, people have never been cheering more for uh, bug software bugs. <laughs> All right. So if you're asking me questions and you don't get answered, um, uh, send send a send a question to Yanai, um, and um, and he'll help you out if I if I can't during this lecture. All right. So first, I want to look at um, comparisons. And in uh, Python, um, uh, comparisons you can compare like two numbers. Are these two numbers the same? Is one bigger than the other? And this is particularly useful when you have a, a variable, when you have a name and you want to uh, compare those two, those two names. The result of a comparison is a, a bool. A bool means something that's either, it's either true or it's false. Those are the only two possibilities. And um, I have on the bottom here some example uh, comparisons uh, so for instance, x greater than one, that compares whether the value that's associated with the name x is larger than one or not. And the result of this expression, x greater than one, the Python language will, will execute that, interpret that. And if x was greater than one, it was x was associated with a, with, an, with a value that's greater than one, then the result of that will be true. And if x was associated with the number one or with something smaller, then the result of that will be false. Okay, so you can do many of the obvious things. X is great, greater than, greater than or equal to. Um, test for equality, whether two um, uh, things are equal by using a double equal sign. This might be a little confusing, but what's going on here is we want to distinguish between two different things in Python. One is an assignment statement where we assign a value to a name. And the other is a comparison whether we, where we compare two names or two things, two expressions for equality. Uh, so we need to indicate which we're talking about to Python. The way that you do that is with a single equal sign for assignment statements and a double equal sign for comparisons. Um, if you write this exclamation equals, 
we pronounce that not equals that that indicates the comparison testing that they're that they're different. And finally, you can write you can chain comparison so you can write two less than x less than five. That'll be true if x is bigger than two and smaller than five. Uh, you can um, uh, well before we, we come start talking about aggregating comparisons. Um, let's uh, let's look at some demos. So I'll show you some example uh, comparisons here. Um, um, I pre-typed in everything for us. So we can take three greater than one, um, and that's true. Three is bigger than one. And um, that gave us a bool. This thing is called a bool. Like we have, we have int, and we have strings, and we have tables, and now we have bools as another uh, type of thing that you can have in Python. All right, so if you write the true, um, that's a bool. Um, a little bit of a caution, uh, the capitalization matters. So capital true is a bool. Lowercase true was a name. Python said, hmm, I see you seem to be referring to uh, the name of a variable that's named true. Uh, but oh, wait, there is no such um, name that you've ever assigned to. So it gives you an error message. So whenever you see an error message, standard advice, how to interpret an error message, start from the bottom. Look at the very last line of the error message. In this case, this is telling us name error. So it says Python thinks there's something to do with a name here and it's confused. And in particular, it tells us this with name it's, it's confused about, it's the name true. It says that's not defined. So hopefully you can figure out from that what went wrong. It's interpreting this as a name and then looking and seeing it is not associated with anything. So if you want a bool, you have to capitalize true or capitalize false. Um, if you were to write something like three equals three, that doesn't do what you wanted. That's not a comparison. That was an assignment statement, but you can't write an assignment statement like that because the left-hand side of an assignment statement before the equals has to be a name. And we didn't put that here. So Python looks at that and says, I see you're trying to do an assignment statement, but you forgot to put in a name syntax error. So if you want to do a comparison, um, the way you do that is, well, that wasn't what I wanted. There we go. Um, oh yeah, nice. All right, so I do three equals equals three and that will compare the two numbers. In this case, the answer is they're equal. And so the result is true. So this expression of value is to true. Uh, you could try comparing an int and a float. What do you think will happen? Kind of interesting. The answer is true. It converts them both into um, the same type so it could do the comparison. Okay, so they're equal. Yes, there are only two bools, true or false. Those are the only two possibilities. See a bunch of questions in the chat. What if I did like this? The answer is false. I, I know what you're doing. You're trying to get me here. You're trying to get me. Oh, you're, you're trying to get me. You're trying to take me, you're trying to get me onto, onto a more, something more complicated. I love it. I love it. Thank you, chat. All right, there was the question in chat. Why the heck did these two get interpreted as equal? Oh man, this is a detail that hopefully you won't have to run into, but it could bite you, which is that in floats in Python have only a limited amount of, we call it limited amount of precision. So they keep a certain number of, of uh, numbers after the decimal point basically. And after that they round, they round it. So uh, uh, if you got, this, this got close enough that it didn't keep that many digits after the decimal point, maybe only kept, I don't know, let's say, think of it like, it's not exactly right, but think of it like maybe about that many. Um, and then it said, well, I can't, uh, you know, I'm gonna have to round this off. I can't store that exactly. And it rounded this to three. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, let's keep going. That's a little bit of a detail. Um, so you can do comparison. There's an inequality. Um, here's two assignment statements. And then I can compare, is X greater than 15? No, X is 14, not bigger than 15. Is it greater than 12? Yep. 
Is it less than 20? Yep, 15 is less than 20. Is it between 12 and 20? Yep, 15 is in between them. Um, what about x minus y? Well, x minus y, x was 14, y was three, so that should be 11. So yep, that's between 10 and 13. So you see the comparison statements, they don't have to be just names or numbers, they can be any expression. You can compare any two expressions. Python will evaluate the expression and then do the comparison. Finally, you can combine um, comparisons. Um, if you want, you can um, write something like this and why Python is interpreting this is it says x greater than 13, that is a, um, that is a comparison. Um, in this case, x was 14, so the answer is true. 14 is greater than 13, so it says, this comparison gave me true. And then it evaluates the second comparison, y less than 3.14, and y was three, so the answer is yes. So that was also true. And then it takes the what's called the Boolean and. It says true and true, which um, the result of that will be uh, true if both of the left, the both on left hand right side are true, and otherwise it'll be false. What does exclamation equals mean again? Exclamation equals means um, not equals. All right. So what was x again? X was 14. And I can do, for instance, x not equal to 7. And the answer is true. 14 is not equal to 7. So this exclamation mark is sometimes pronounced not. Does using or work? Yep. Let's try it. Uh, let's try it if I can press the right keys. Very good, very good. X greater than 13 or Y less than 3.1459. Well, both of those are true. So the result is true. Or will give you true if either the left-hand side is true or the right-hand side or both. For instance, I could change it like this. That's still true, even though Y is not less than two because X is greater than 13. Can you do equal exclamation mark? All right, one way to test this is to try it, is to open a notebook and enter it into the notebook and see what happens. So let's try it and see what happens. Ah, oh, I don't know what that just did, but it didn't seem to do a comparison. Something weird, did something weird. Ah, did something really weird, so don't do that. <laughs> All right, I don't know what it did, but you can't set, you can't use equal exclamation mark. You have to use exclamation equals. All right, that's conditionals. Um, sorry, I can't get to all your questions. Send them to Yanai, he'll answer. He's, he's, he's great. All right, next thing I wanna look at is um, how to combine comparisons. Um, sometimes you will have, um, do a bunch of comparisons. And you'll store the results maybe in an array or a list or something like that. And then um, we'd like to aggregate them. So what does aggregating mean? Aggregating is like a fancy, fancy word for giving a whole lot of data, uh, uh, like summarize it or combine it into a single value. All right. So suppose you've got, you've done um, a whole bunch of comparisons and you've got an array or a list of the results of all those comparisons. Um, uh, like for all the students in the class, comparing whether their uh, grade in the class is above the threshold to get an A. So I've got an array with one element per student in the class that's true if they're getting an A or false if they're not. Then maybe I would like to do something like um, count how many of you are getting an A, all right? Well, it turns out that one way you can do that is you ask Python to sum the array or the list. And with bools, the summing, counts the number that are true. It's kind of a weird thing. We wouldn't think of like adding true plus true, but you can do it. All right, so basically it's gonna convert the true to a one and the false to a zero and then add them up. So if I had true, false, true in my array and I added up all the values in the array, the true get converted to one, the false get converted to zero, and then I'd add them up and I get the number two, which is indeed the number of two of trues in that list. There are two trues in the list. And if you can say that two times fast, you're too cool for me. All right. Um, so if you use the sum uh, function, that will help you count the number of things that are true in a list. All right. Um, 
demo. You can um, use comparisons with arrays. So let me make an array. And uh, now if I try to do a comparison between an array and a value, well, remember the left-hand side here was an array. The right-hand side is just a, a string. It's not an array. So the, um, the comparison operators, when they, when they see that one of the two things is an array, they'll actually do that comparison to every item in the array and make you a new array. Uh, so it's doing that one at a time for each item in the array. It's like if I was going to make an array of numbers and then I said that array plus one, it would add one to every, make a new, a new array with one added to every element in the array. Well, here it's like I'm making a new array where, where each element has been compared to cat and the result is going to be true or false. So what I get out here is it was cat, cat, dog. So I get true, true, false. I hope this makes sense. All right, so how many trues are in this array? Well, the true is a one, true is a one, false is a zero, true is a one, false is a zero, false is a zero. So I could add it up by hand and I would get three, um, but you could do it using the sum operation. If you sum up, ask sum to sum up an array, which is a weird thing to do, and it's an array of bools, then it'll convert the bools to ones and zeros and then add up those ones and zeros, which effectively is counting how many are true. So if I write an expression like sum pets equals equals dog, that looks super arcane, but you'll now know what it's doing. Python interprets first the expression pets equals equals dog to get this array of trues and falses that indicate which elements were equal to dog. And then it's gonna sum that array which it's going to convert the trues and falses to ones and zeros and add up. And that's going to count how many is true. So it's going to count how many elements of the array were dog. And if we look up here, there were be two dogs. Okay. Oof. Yeah, you, you might encounter the term implicit coercion. The true got converted to a one. Can I sum the comparison of two arrays? Nice. Let's try it. I like that question. That's a good question. Um, all right. Okay. Let's make an another array. Um, all right. How many were there? One, two, three, four, five, six. I better put six in here. All right, and we'll do that. Okay, I made another array. And then let's compare two arrays. Let's see what happens. You can do it. And it's going to compare the corresponding elements of the array. So cat is equal to cat. So the first thing was true. Cat is not equal to Joe, so that was false. Dog not equal to bunny, so false. Cat was equal to cat, so true. Dog not equal to lizard, false. Rabbit not equal to wolverine, false. All right, so now I could write this expression. And you tell me what that is computing. In English, maybe you leave me a chat message. How would you explain what that is computing? What's it? What is it doing? Yeah, it's counting the number that are true. And what is the number that are true? Well, it's counting um, the number of uh, elements where they, they match, where these arrays match, counting the number of positions where these arrays have an have a equal value. So good, 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 good. If you see that weird looking code, you'll know what it's doing. I saw lots of questions. Uh, uh, what if, what's the difference between a list and an array? Uh, they're very similar. An array is intended if you have the same type in every element in the array, like it's all of them are numbers or all of them are strings. Whereas a list, you don't have that restriction. And an array lets you do these kind of operations. Arrays are great when you want to do the same thing on every element of the array. Um, lists don't do that for you. 
So for a lot of the stuff we're doing, we're going to want to do the same operation on every element of the array. And so then we're going to use an array, not a list. But if you don't need those, um, if you don't care about those restrictions, they don't apply, then there are settings where arrays and lists are kind of interchangeable. Um, do both arrays have to have the same number of indices to do that? Yes, I think they do. You could try it on your own, but I think they have to have the same length to be able to compare them. Um, what if they weren't the same length? I don't know. We'd get some error. We could try it. We can find out. Um, um, uh, you probably get some kind of a, some kind of an unhappy error. Let's 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 make this a different length array. Ta da! And then let's see what happens if we try to compare two arrays that are different lengths. Error message, value error. I read the text of it. Start at the bottom of any error message. It says shape mismatch. Objects can make, cannot be broadcast to a single shape. What the heck is that saying? Well, shape refers to, in this case, the length of the array, saying there's a mismatch. They're not the same length. In this arcane language, that's what it's saying to you. Cannot be broadcast to a single shape. It was like trying, trying really hard to convert them so we could compare them. For them to be compared, it had to be the same shape, had to be the same length. It's trying really hard, but just couldn't figure out how to do it and said, sorry, I gave up. Can't, can't make them same length, can't compare them. You're stuck. Sorry, bud. All right. Very good. Um, another way you could do this, you could use this. Um, a library function called count non-zero. That does the same thing. It's just an alternate way to do the exact same thing. That's the same as sum pets equals equals dog. Um, remember that you can make an array uh, by using this a range function, which will give you, this will give me all the numbers 20, 21, 22, up to 30, but not including 31. So then that range I, is an array. I can use comparison operations on it. So if I did, is that greater than 28? The answer is most of them are not, but the last two are. OK. Very good, very good. Hope we're doing OK so far. Uh, control statements. I want to teach you a little bit about control statements. So control statements are ways that you can, um, that uh, the data can influence which computation you do in Python. They control the code that gets run. They control the computation. And there's two of them I want to tell you about. I want to tell you about if, and I want to tell you about for. These are two kinds of control statements. The if statement lets you um, do some computation, run some code conditionally, only if some condition is met, all right? So very useful when you're defining functions, uh, because a function might be called many times with different, different arguments operating on different data. And suppose you want to um, uh, do something different depending on the value of the argument. Then you use an if statement. All right. Maybe I wanted to write a function that converts your numerical grade in this class to a letter grade. If your numerical grade was above 90, let's say, then you're above the cutoff and you get an A. If your numerical grade was above 80, let's say, maybe you're above the cutoff for a B and you get a, a B. So I might write a function that uses an if statement, say if, if your grade was above 90, then return A. If your grade was between 80 and 90, return B and so on. All right, so that would um, execute different code and return different value depending on the argument, the grade. Is 90 the actual cutoff? No, sorry, don't take that seriously. Uh, please don't pay too much attention to those specific numbers. That was just an example. All right, let's do a demo. Um, um, and uh, you know what? I'm going to do a very simple demo before I start doing a more complicated one. Um, let's see. Maybe I want to set some variables. I'm going to give myself some cells. Uh, 
Suppose I had a variable x is 13. And then if x is, uh, hmm, let's set y to be 1. And then if x is greater than 10, set y to be 2. All right. So I'm going to run this code. And now I want you to tell me what will the value of y be? Well, let's see. The answer is 2. Because x was greater than 10. And so we assign to y. If I wrote this, if x is greater than 20, now what, the, what will the value of y be? Let's see. The answer is still 2. x was not greater than 20, so we didn't execute this code. We didn't execute this assignment statement. Yeah, what about 4? Let's look at four also. Four is kind of fun. Let's do four. So four is called a for loop. And four is a way that you can execute the same code many, many times. Um. All right, there is a way to print, I love cats. See, I set the variable x to hold cats. And then this plus, remember, with two strings does a concatenation. It just appends one to the other. So, and then the print statement prints the string. So this displayed the message, I love cats. Now, suppose that I love lots of animals. I do. Remember this pets array? Um, Actually, let's define a new one. We have an array of cats. We have dogs, different kind of animals that you could have. You could have bunnies. You don't have to be just pets. All right, there's different kinds of animals. There's an array. So a for loop, what I can do is I can write a for loop like this. For x in animals. like this. All right, so what did this for loop do? This is um, uh, what the way to interpret this is for each element of the array animals, we're going to run the code once. So this has four elements in this array. So we're going to run this code four times. And what's different about those four times? The only difference is what the name x is assigned to is different each of those four times. So the first time we run the code, x is assigned to the first element in the array. x is assigned to cats. And then we run this code, this print statement, and it prints out, I love cats. And then the second time around, um, x is assigned to the second element in the array, dogs. And we run the print statement. The print statement prints, I love dogs. And then bunnies, and then hummingbirds. All right. So um, uh, that's a for loop. In general, the for loop has for something in something. This part here is an array, could also be a list. And it's going to um, uh, execute the code once per item in that array or that list. Okay. And this part here, this example x, is a name. That name gets assigned to. So we call this a for loop. We call this iteration. Um, we like think we're looping over this code and, and running it many times, iterating, iterating over the array. Those are different languages people might use. All right, I see a bunch of questions. Let me see if there's any of them I can answer. Could I put the print statement before the four X in animals? Nope, wouldn't work. Let's say I do this. Let's look, look at what happens. Uh, first off, Python's like, what? I'm expecting something after the for loop. Let's say I put nothing in there. Still says, what? I'm expecting something there. So I put something there. Python says, okay. And now what it does is it prints 
once, and then it does the for loop. And in the for loop, it does uh, the code, we call it inside the for loop, this indented code here that comes after the for statement, um, uh, does that once for each element in the array. All right. Um, you can have multiple lines of code in your for loop, as long as they all have the same indentation. All right, so what happened here? We did this for loop and we executed these three lines of code four times. So the first time we did it with cats. Animals are great, they're so fun. Cats are one of my favorites. Then we did it again with dogs and so on. All right, so uh, everything with the same level of indentation will be treated as, this is called the body of the for loop. And that body will be executed multiple times. The first time we execute these three lines in that order. And then the next time we execute those three lines again, but with a different value of X. Can I use any variable after the four? Uh, any name, this could be any name. That's a name that's gonna get assigned to. Could I do, just do print, I love, aha, I like that idea. Let's look at what happens. And the answer is no, can't. Why not? Tries to evaluate this expression, I love plus animals. And for whatever reason, Python doesn't like that. Sorry. You could do, oh, I guess you can't do that. Uh, yeah, yeah, plus doesn't, uh, plus isn't work quite right. Okay, I guess you can't do it. Don't ask me to explain why. Uh, there's a reason, but I don't think I can give a very good explanation. Does the print statement have to be in a second line and indented? Um, uh, basically, yes. Uh, for the purposes of this class, I want you to say yes. The, the stuff after the for loop that's going to get executed many times should, always should be on the next line and should be indented. And this indent is how Python tells this code is the body of the for loop and it's gonna be run multiple times. And if you wanna have multiple lines there, you want, there's multiple things you wanna do for each X, then you just put multiple lines of code all with the same indent. Hasn't X already been defined as a variable? Yep, it's getting redefined here. It's kind of like there's an, what's happening here is Python is doing an assignment statement, X equals two cats. And then it's running this code. And then it's doing another assignment, x equals dogs, and it's running this code. And even though the name already exists, you can do an assignment statement, and that just overwrites the previous value, forgets what the previous value were, and associates with, with the new value. Um, about while loops, we're not going to do those in this class, I think. Uh, yeah, maybe we will. I can show you while loops if you want to know. What's a while loop? Um, Here's a while loop. Oof, that's a little confusing. There's a bunch of code there. If you really wanted to know, I don't think you need to know it. Um, here we assigned i to the value one. And then we executed this loop. It's kind of like a for loop, just a little different, a little different way. Just going to keep doing it keep doing it as long as this thing is true. And we uh, printed the value of i, it was one. And then we reassigned i, we did an assignment statement. The right hand side, i plus one. Well, that's one plus one, that's two. So it assigned two to the name i. And then we're gonna go back and we're gonna do the loop another time. Checks is two less than 10. Yep, so we're gonna do the loop. And two and three and four and five. All right, not, not the greatest way to do that. There's a better way to do that. Better way to do that is One, one better way to do that. For loop. Boom. An even better way, use np.a range. Boom. 
All right, let's create an array with the numbers one through 10, but not including 10. And then did a for loop for each uh, element in that array. It uh, assigned I to that, printed that, and did that once for each in the array. Wow, lots of the, lots, lots, lots and lots of questions in chat. I'm sorry, I'm not getting to all of them. Um, I'm gonna jump on ahead. I'm gonna jump on ahead, um, but I invite you to send them to Yanai if I didn't get to them, I'm so sorry. All right, simulation. Let's, um, let's look at um, how to use this for simulation. So I want you to imagine we're gonna play a game, very simple game, we troll a die. If my number's bigger, you're gonna pay me a dollar. If your number's bigger, I pay you a dollar. If they're the same, nothing, it's a wash. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to simulate this game. We're gonna imagine um, simulating this game and we're gonna see how much money I win if I were to play you a lot of times. Now I could just play you for a while and that'd be kind of fun for a while and then it would be kind of boring for a while and actually probably wouldn't be very fun for very long at all because it's such a simple game. So it'd get really tedious really quickly, um, but computers are great at tedious stuff. Anytime you got something tedious, oh my, that is what computers are built for, taking away the tedium from our lives. So we're gonna have the computer do this for us, to have the computer pretend to play this game with a pretend me and a pretend you. And I wanna show you how we're gonna write code to do that. And this is gonna be a pattern we're gonna see over and over in this class where we simulate some things. And here I'm picking a particularly simple thing to simulate, but we'll build up to simulating more and more complicated stuff. This is, can be super powerful um, in physics. People use simulations to um, uh, predict uh, the properties of matter, what's gonna to happen to the stars, um, you know, what are possible theories of the world and how would the universe have evolved? People predict in, in biology, predict how this protein is going to fold and what is the structure it's going to have and what are the effects it's going to have on the body and is this drug going to work? And in this class, we're going to use simulations to, well, you'll see. You'll see what we'll use them for. All right. So um, how are we going to simulate this? I'm going to find a way to... Um, simulate the role of a die so that we can uh, do one step of this game. Then we're gonna write some code that based on the outcomes of what the die turned up, we're gonna compute how much money I won or how much money I lost. And then we're gonna have the computer do that over and over and over again. All right, so um, let's, um, let's write a, a function. We're gonna define a function to compute um, um, how much money that I won after one round of this game, after playing this game once, all right? So we're gonna write a function and this function is gonna be helpful to us. So, so this is gonna be a task to, we're gonna put it in a function um, and I'm gonna give it a name and the name I've chosen is one round because it's playing one round of this game. It's not 10,000 of them, just once. And what do we need to know to know how much money I won? We got to know what my die came up with and what your die came up with. So those are the two pieces of information that are going to be needed. So this function is going to need them as arguments. So we're going to write them in the arguments of this function. And now this function is going to have to do some stuff and we're going to want it to return how many dollars I won. All right, so I got us started here. If uh, my role was bigger than your role. We said, I win a dollar. So this function should return one dollar. All right, so let's, let's try it out. Let's try out this code. Uh, if I got a four and you got a three, I win a dollar. If I got a two and you got a six, wait a minute, wait a minute. No output, where's my output? There's nothing being displayed. I'm not seeing anything here. What did I expect to get from this function? What should I want to get from this function? I want this function to tell me I lost a dollar. Should be giving me minus one, but it didn't. What's going wrong? What's going wrong? Oh, I don't have any code for that. I didn't write that in my code. What am I doing? What am I doing? I need some code for that. See, if my role was less than your role, this if statement said, well, that condition is not true. So don't execute this line of code. In fact, don't execute anything. Function didn't do anything, didn't return anything. And so nothing got displayed. That wasn't what I wanted. If my role is less than your role, 
then, oh, this function should return minus one. I lost a dollar. All right, let's try it again. Yes, much better, much better. I get a two, you get a six. I lose a dollar. All right, let's do one more, one or two more checks. Okay, that looks good. I get a three, you get a five. Um, I lost a dollar. All right, one more check. I got a three, you got a three. Uh-oh, what did I miss? What did I miss? Yeah, I missed the case. What if our roles are equal? And I didn't win anything. All right, all right, all right. This is better, this is better. I think we got it now. Good, 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 good. Okay, all right. So now I've covered all the cases. Either my role is bigger or we're smaller or is equal. All right, so let's review what we did. We got here a function that um, given, given the dice rolls that I got when we played this game once, it'll tell me how much I won. What if I wanted to know how much you won? Do I copy paste this code and write a new version where I reverse the ones and the minus ones? There's a better way. How much did you win? You win. If I win a dollar, you you lose a dollar. If I lose a dollar, you win a dollar. So you can just negate the value from this function. All right. So we didn't need to write a new function. This function was enough. All right. Lots of questions. Lots of questions. Lots of questions. Um, let's see. Okay. One question. What if I just wrote a single equal sign? Oh no, that'd be bad. Oh no. If I wrote that, oh, bad stuff, bad stuff, bad stuff. Don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. Python's gonna look at that and say, that looks like an assignment statement. It looks like you're trying to assign to my role. Not what we wanna do. We're not trying to do an assignment, we're trying to do a comparison. You gotta indicate which of those you mean. And then the way you do it in Python, I know it's confusing, it's weird. You're just gonna have to get used to it. The single equal sign means assignment, double equals means comparison. You had to have, Python had to have two separate ways of indicating those two things and that's the way that it shows. So that's why we use this double equal sign. All right, is there a function that makes Python randomly generate numbers? Yeah, we're gonna need that. We're gonna get to that real soon. Um, is there any way to add up how much money I'd win or I'd, after I do this play this game many times? We're gonna get to that too. Um, all right, why didn't I use else? I could have used else. I could have used else. That totally would have been, been okay. Um, in this case, I've only shown you if statements. I haven't shown you else. All right, you could do else as well. This is another thing you can do in Python. You can do else. Um, you could do else. You could do if else. Do this. So else, what this will do is if the condition is true, it'll run this code. And if not, the else thing says run the other code. I could do it that way. I could do it that way. I didn't need to, but this would also work. Let's try it. Give me the same answers. That works too. That works too. Um, and in fact, it's so common. Well, actually, you know, I might as well, I could use an else here too, right? That'd work. So what's going on here? If my role is bigger than your role, it'll run this one line of code. Otherwise, else, if not, It'll run these four lines of code. How did it know to run all four of them? Because they're indented and they're after the else. So this would work. This would work. Given all the same answers. See, if it's not true that my role is bigger than yours and it's not true that my role is smaller than yours, then I guess the only other possibility was that they are equal. So in that case, we could return zero. That'd work. Now, it's so common. This is, this is ugly. This is ugly. We got this else and then we got an if and we got all these indentation. And it's so common in Python to have an else followed immediately by an if that actually there's a shorthand way to do that. The shorthand way is there's kind of shorthand for else, else, if. And the way you do that in Python is with this thing, elif. Elif, what is elif? Elif says, well, if this condition was not true, then, you know, else, if this condition was not true, then do another if statement. Test if this next condition is true. 
And if that the next one's true, then return minus one. If that's not true either, if neither of these were true, return zero. So that's a more concise, that's a more concise way. And you could have done this and it gives the exact same answers. So there, you got about three or four different ways of writing code differently that achieves the same result. Okay, okay, okay. Put it all together. We got it, we got it now. We got code that'll do this if we have the role and for one single, one single iteration. So now what we're gonna to need to do, as someone pointed out, is we need to figure out a way to roll the dice once. We need to get a random number. So let me show you how you do random, random selection. All right, if I have an array, if I have an array of some values, then I can use this function called np.random.choice. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna internally basically kind of like flip a coin and it's gonna choose randomly among all the elements in the array and give you one. So it's, this time it's decided I'm gonna randomly choose, oh, time to wake up today. And if I call it again, I gotta wake up. And I call it again, I gotta wake up. Oh my gosh. Maybe I'm always gonna get wake up. Maybe it's always gonna be the same answer. Nope, sleep in. So what's going on? Each time I call it, it flips a new coin and randomly chooses among these possibilities. And I just so happened to get the same answer from the coin flip the first three times and the fourth time I got a different answer. All right? All right. Now, another thing you can do, yeah, you're virtually flipping a coin. You're having the computer virtually flip a coin inside it for you. So this is how you can make a random choice. Another way to make a choice is um, you can say, well, I want you to do that um, seven times. Give me an array where you did it seven times. All right, so there's an array where it chose for the seven days of the week for each one, whether you're gonna wake up or you're gonna sleep in. Now, let's suppose I wanted to do that, choose randomly seven times and then figure out how many of those days am I waking up? Well, I could do that, make an array where I choose randomly seven times and then count how many, we already saw how to compare all of those elements to uh, a string and then count how many were true. In other words, count how many times this array has wake up in it. So there. I can run it multiple times and I'm gonna get each time it's gonna flip new coins and maybe get a different answer or maybe the same. All right, so this week I woke up four times. Next week, woke up five times that week. Next week, I slept in three times. All right, so if you want to make a random choice and you want to do some something with that array, maybe many times, you might want to assign that array to a name. Okay, so there I've assigned it to a name. And now, now if I count how many times that array has wake up in it, now I'm going to get the same answer every time because I'm not flipping new coins. I've flipped coins once, assigned, assigned that array to morning week, and now I get the same, same value every time. So this week I woke up four times and I slept in three times. Okay, I made the random choice only once. All right, so this is how you do random selection. Now you can use this with dice. If you wanted to randomly roll a die, we're gonna make an array that contains all of the possible values that could be on the array, on the die. What's in this array? It's the numbers one, two, three, four, five, six. Those are the numbers on a die. And then we're gonna randomly choose from that array. We're gonna make a random choice, okay? So there, I made a random choice. But each time I run this, it virtually flips a coin or virtually rolls a die and gives me another random choice from that array, which is like a random number on a die, all right? So we've got a way to simulate flipping a die and then now I can simulate one roll of this game. The virtual me rolls a virtual dice using this code and saves the result in my roll. Okay, so that's a number one through six. The virtual you rolls a virtual dice, uh, new dice, new number possibly, saves that under the name your roll. And then we compare our rolls and see who won. And we figure out how much money I run and we could do that using that function I just wrote. All right, so there's a code that will simulate one round of this game. So let's do it. Simulate one round of this game. And uh, 
This time I won nothing. So let's do it again. Let's play the game again. Ha ha, virtual me won a dollar. Take that virtual you. Do it again. Oh, I lost a dollar. Good job, virtual you. Okay, so each time we run this function, it's rolling virtual dice, it's comparing them, it's figuring out how much money was won, and it's returning how much money I won. So we figured out how to make the computer simulate this game, simulate playing one round of this game. And next week lecture, we'll continue from here and seeing how to put this all together to simulate 10,000 rounds of this game. And it turns out that's gonna be almost as easy as simulating one round of the game because anything a computer can do once, it can do many times really well. All right, we're gonna stop here. I'll stick around for any questions. Thanks so much for your patience with me today as I tried to get through this lecture a little bit less organized than usual. Have a great weekend and don't forget to turn in homework four and do your vitamin. Bye everyone.